sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Okay, these are the notes where we are going to examine U.S. expansion and the concept of manifest destiny. Uh, specifically, in these notes, we're going to look at the Texas fight for independence, how Texas becomes independent of Mexico, and kind of introduce the, uh, or we're going to kind of introduce where the, uh, the history starts, where Texas becomes a part of the United States. Uh, I also want to take this time to direct you back to the notes on Jacksonian democracy and make sure that you look at John C. Calhoun, the nullification crisis, up to uh, the election of William Henry Harrison, which you'll see in just a second. You will be responsible for those notes. All right, so uh, let's get going. And we talked in class about the election of 1840 and um, how William Henry Harrison, um, a hero of the War of 1812, defeats Martin Van Buren. He is a Whig candidate, which is a kind of a huge deal because remember the last president uh, to not be a Republican, Democratic, Republican, or Democrat was actually John Adams, uh, the Federalist candidate, and that was way back in 1796. So, uh, you know, Democrats have reigned supreme for quite some time. 1796. Now, Harrison, bless his heart, gives a two-hour inaugural address. It's raining. It's cold. He doesn't wear his coat. And then he goes on a parade, celebratory parade, which we see even today for presidents that get elected. He goes on this ride, and he gets sick. He catches pneumonia. 32 days later, he dies in office. He becomes the first president to die in office. He is also the last president to be born before the Declaration of Independence. Now, there is kind of this mythology that we discussed in class, this uh, curse if you will, of Tippecanoe, because remember, Harrison burned down Prophet's Town at the Battle of Tippecanoe. And the curse is just this concept of every president that is elected in a year ending with zero would die before leaving office. And the eerie thing about it is it holds true. Lincoln in 1860 is assassinated, 1880, the president assassinated 1900, so on and so forth, all the way up to Ronald Reagan in 1980. He is going to be the person that breaks this curse. Now, an assassination attempt is carried out, but he lives. And then Bush is, also lives through an assassination attempt, and he nearly chokes on a pretzel. So those two presidents probably beat the curse. But uh, I guess we'll just have to see until the election of 1920, or excuse me, 2020, to know for sure. Now, the most interesting thing, or probably the most important thing about William Henry Harrison's brief tenure as presidency and his death while in office is what it does, because remember what the vice president's job is. He takes over when the president dies. John Tyler takes over presidency. There's not an armed insurrection or any such thing as that, people trying to overthrow the government. This doesn't happen. He becomes president peacefully, so it shows that our system works. Now, we haven't spent a lot of time on Mexico, but they have been there for quite some time, uh, originally controlled by Spain. Um, as you can see, everything down here was originally the Spanish Empire, in, or the Empire in North America, so to speak. In 1821, Mexico uh, fights for its independence, and it wins. It basically is in control of its own land now. Uh, the issue here is that it's such a new government, and its, uh, its government is located down here in this region here in Mexico City, and it has this very broad area, which it is now controlling. All of this is under the Mexican domain. That's a lot of land to try to take care of. So what they do is they get this broad idea that if they let Americans come into the area in exchange for land and give them certain uh, jobs, certain needs and wants, that they'll be able to dictate the policy and control the territory uh, a whole lot simpler. Stephen Austin, keyword Austin, Austin, Texas, is going to come into Texas. He's going to help set up these new providential governments in Texas. Now, Austin is, rather, uh, is a rather interesting figure. Uh, he sets Texas up to be kind of this moral society that's going to be free of gamblers, free of drunks, uh, free of people who curse. And to add to this, Mexico was uh, anti-slavery. Slavery was illegal in Mexico. Um, so a lot of Americans moving into this, uh, these new areas are not supposed to have slavery. Austin's going to hand out land grants to anybody that wants them. Now, keep in mind, Keep in mind, uh, land is uh, quite an incentive to move somewhere at this time. Land is wealth. So a lot of people are going to move into these territories. Many Americans are going to come. Um, Mexico primarily wants the land to be used for corn. Uh, a lot of southern 
farmers that are going to move into the area know that this is not a very lucrative uh, commodity for them to grow. They want to grow cotton uh, because that's what sells in Europe, and they know they can make money off that. The problem is that cotton is very labor intensive, like we saw, and they want to bring slaves. Uh, there's an issue. Mexico doesn't allow slavery, like I said before. So what a lot of these guys are going to do is they're going to make them become indentured servants, which is basically just another name for slavery at this time. Uh, Mexico is going to kind of go along with this policy for quite some time. Now, Texas itself had been kind of uh, sought after by the Americans for some time. John Quincy Adams offered Mexico $1 million for it. Andrew Jackson offered $5 million. Both times, Mexico refuses. And then, like I said before, Mexico is going to ban slavery. So Americans want for Texas' farmland and not getting it is starting to weigh on the minds, as well as Mexico's uh, determined effort to keep slavery from being an institution in their, in their, uh, in their land. Now, Mexico is going to run into some border issues. Because of this flood of Americans entering the area, they're not growing corn like the Mexicans want. They're growing cotton. And on top of that, they're bringing their slaves, which is an issue all in itself. Mexico is going to start to seal its border. So you're going to have an immigration issue. Many Americans still wanting land are going to continue to enter Mexico illegally. Uh, so this illegal immigration is going to uh, become quite a problem. Now, Austin, in the meantime, is vying for more self-government in Texas. He's a initially wanting to vie for Texas statehood as a part of the Texas government. Uh, this is going to be refused by a lot of uh, a lot of congressmen. And there are some other issues that are going on at the time, but this is the brief uh, synopsis I want you to look at. President of Mexico at the time is uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Anta, uh, self-dubbed, like we said in class, the Napoleon of the West. And the reason uh, he kind of holds that title is because he's he's kind of an endeared person in Mexico. He is the uh, famous general responsible for the independence from Spain. Um, so he's he's kind of an important figure, and he's uh, very much kind of a celebrity. He's going to be Mexico's president numerous times, numerous times. He's going to be elected, and then he's going to be uh, deposed, and then brought back, put into exile, brought back as emperor, so on and so forth. So he's got an interesting career. Um, he originally meets with Stephen Austin to talk about certain grievances that Texas has, but he doesn't adhere to this idea of Texas statehood. Um, eventually, Austin is going to try to advocate Texas statehood anyway, and Santa Ana, to prevent uh, any type of revolution, is going to have Stephen Austin arrested, which is uh, going to kind of backfire and just cause more rebellions in Texas. Texas is going to call for uh, Texans to raise arms and to start an independence movement, while at the same time Santa Ana is trying to disarm Texans. So you've kind of got some hostilities on the rise. Now, eventually, this is going to break out into a big fight. Uh, eventually, Texans had initial victories. Uh, you had the uh, Battle of Gonzales. Uh, you also had the Battle of uh, Concepcion, uh, which would is what some people consider the first major fight in the uh, Texas Revolution. Um, but a, a lot of these battles early on are going to be Texas victories. Uh, they're going to receive a lot of volunteers from America to help, such as the New Orleans Grays who were uh, a little bit better soldiers than the Texas militia troops. They had some kind of resemblance of discipline. Um, and you're also going to have the famous uh, American frontiersman, Davy Crockett, come to help later on as well. But these, uh, these volunteers, the Texas militia, they're going to actually run uh, the Mexican armies out of Texas initially. They're going to set up a provincial government, and they're going to put a man by the name of Sam Houston in charge as commander-in-chief of the armies. Uh, you may want to write that down, Sam Houston, Commander-in-Chief of the Armies. So you've got Houston, Texas, and you've got Austin, Texas, and these people are going to be very influential in Texas's uh, future foundation. Now, eventually the Mexicans having uh, enough of these initial assaults are going to push back, and they're going to run into a Spanish mission called the Alamo. Uh, and this is where Santa Ana is going to run up onto this old Spanish mission, what is the very famous standoff between the Texans and the Volunteers and Santa Ana. Around 187 men, women, and children are held up in the Alamo, including uh, David Bowie and uh, Davy Crockett. They're going to hold off two very large-scale initial attacks from this old Spanish mission that they had fortified. 
uh, on the third attack, the Mexicans are going to overrun the fort. Or Santa Ana is going to ruthlessly kill everyone that is in the fort, including the beloved Davy Crockett. Now, because of what happened, um, this ruthless slaughter, you can imagine a lot of Texans are very uh, put off by Santa Ana at this point. But Houston, Sam Houston being the uh, knowledgeable man that he is, is going to put the Texas Army into sort of a retreat. He knows that he cannot fight Santa Ana's army face-to-face -face in an open ground, so he's looking for better ground. There's also some beliefs that this uh, retreat may have been Houston trying to make it over to New Orleans or into uh, Louisiana, where at the time... Uh, Austin actually was. So there's a lot of credence to the idea that Houston may have been trying to lead the Mexican army into the U.S. because that would have gotten Andrew Jackson and the United States involved, uh, which would not have been a good idea for the Mexican army at the time. Uh, eventually, Santa Ana is, is going to stay on the heels of Houston. He's going to try very hard to press his army very hard to keep up with Houston. Houston eventually is going to turn towards San Jacinto, which is spelled just like it is down here, San Jacinto, uh, to lead Santa Ana to a favorable ground. The two armies are going to square up. Remember, the Alamo will be the battle cry before this large-scale battle actually takes place. Uh, Santa Ana actually puts his army on a stand-down because he doesn't think Houston will attack such a large army. But it eventually does happen. At about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Sam Houston drives real hard to the Mexican army that was not ready. It caught him totally by surprise. The battle is over in 18 minutes. Enormous casualties. Uh for the Mexican army. The Texan army loses very, very little, and they're going to capture Santa Ana. Now, in return for Santa Ana's life, the Texans are going to force him to sign the Treaty of Alaska, which gives Texas its independence. Um, they're actually going to have some issues with Santa Ana. Mobs are going to form. They're going to want him dead. Uh, they're eventually going to take him to Washington, D.C., to sort of do this in front of President, President Andrew Jackson. The problem is, is that the Mexican government actually deposes Santa Ana as he's away. Uh, so the Mexican government never really uh, ratifies the Treaty of Alaska, and it never recognizes Texas independence up until the Mexican-American War. Uh, at the conclusion of this whole event, though, uh, Sam Houston, who is enormously popular, is going to become president of the new Republic of Texas. So at this time, Texas is its own independent country from Mexico and from the United States. But today we know Texas as a state. That's because it's going to be annexed in 1845. And how does it get this way? Well, initially, a lot of Texans want this annexation of Texas. Uh, a lot of politicians in the U.S. do not, however. Uh, and it has a lot to do with this issue. Is it going to be a slave state or is it going to be a free state? Uh, keep in mind voting policies. And would that concept of it being slave or free anger Mexico and draw us into another war? And then along comes the new president, who we'll talk about next time, James K. Polk. All right, so look over these notes. Go back and study them if you need be. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments below, and we'll see you next time. Me, no more, my lady.